I've been really pushing the idea of uh, Franken trees, which are just trees with all kinds of different varieties on them. You know, I have one here that had up to 150 varieties of apples at one time. It has about 100 now, and I've literally seen 100 different fruits on it in one year. So if you want to collect them, you have to trade sticks with somebody and, and uh, graft them. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that brings together gardening, food, and the human story. I'm your host, Emma Biggs. And I'm Stephen Biggs. We talk to creative food gardeners and farm and garden experts who break the rules and make new ones, too. What do you collect? For me, it's been fig trees. I had 50 plus varieties for a while. Not nearly as many as more rabid collectors, but enough to drive my family crazy. Gardening books, too. Get me in a used bookstore and I head straight over to check out the gardening books. I'm fascinated with how people package information. When I was a kid, it was collecting beer caps. I remember my folks thought that was a weird habit for a kid, although somehow lots of kids did the same thing at the time. I never tried to pass the beer cap collection on to my kids, but I found someone, a fellow garden writer, who had a passion for ephemera, particularly as it related to beer. And Larry made sure that my beer cap collection went to a good home. I'm glad I had a couple special beer caps in there. Lethbridge beer, old enough that the underside of the cap had cork and foil. My Uncle Hank gave me that when he found it in a wall when he was fixing up his house. Our guest today is also a collector, a collector of apple varieties. Stephen Edholm is a California homesteader who's fascinated with self-reliance and with teaching skills that in times past were common. As you might have guessed by the snippet at the beginning, one of those skills is grafting. Grafting with stuff you probably already have around the house. And grafting for more than just practical reasons. How about a heart-shaped fruit tree? You can find Stephen online at skillcult.com and check out his Skill Cult YouTube channel. If you go there, you'll find that he has an 11-part grafting series, and I really recommend it. Now, here's my chat with Stephen Edholm. Stephen, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Maybe we could start out just by finding out a little bit about Skill Cult and your homestead, Turkey Song. Tell us about them. Skill Cult is kind of my project of a lifetime, just tying together all of my interests and the skills I've gathered and knowledge I've, you know, brought together over my life, which has been, you know, since I was about even 16, but definitely by the time I graduated high school, I was super interested in self-reliance of all kinds. And so, you know, kind of ever since that I've been studying that stuff. The idea with Skill Cult was just to bring everything together uh without being focused on any one particular thing just kind of general self-reliance interests and uh, skills and over time that's kind of focused more on homesteading although i have a a lot of background in what people would call primitive technology like stone age living skills and all kinds of other stuff like that so yeah skill cult is just kind of my random meanderings through that stuff, uh, trying to help educate people and do uh, research and development at the same time, you know, kind of spit out and put out onto the internet what I already know, and also keep, you know, innovating and experimenting. And because that's kind of the stuff that's always kept me going and, and kept me interested. A note for our listeners, too, is that um, the diversity of things that you have on there is pretty neat because uh, you might have a post on grafting, say, and then there's another post on the properties of good axe handle. So it's quite varied. Yeah. And uh, that's been somewhat of a problem for me. And, uh, you know, just it's easier to get a large following and grow my YouTube channel if I'm more focused but that's just not me. You know, I'm a polymath and I get bored easily. So mm. I'm always into something and I just, yeah, seem to know things 
on a level that is kind of uncommon. And I feel an obligation to put some of that material out there. And it's great. It's been it's been really good in terms of the effect, you know, which is relatively small for what a YouTube channel could be or an or a general audience. It has a lot of influence. And and Turkey Song is the other piece of the puzzle, I guess you could say, that goes along with Skill Cult. Well, originally I named this uh homestead that I live on now Turkey Song because I thought it was just really funny uh, because like all the hippies here in Northern California name their properties like River Song and Mountain Spirit <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> uh, we just have a lot of turkeys here and they're they're just funny sounding so I called it Turkey Song. Uh, yeah I'm actually going to be leaving this homestead right now I'm trying to save money to buy a new place and start over which you know is rough because I put in over 15 years here I guess it's been about 17 years um, and some of the stuff, a lot of the work I can't move, but I'm hoping the silver lining is that I'll get a little bit easier place to farm with some flat fertile ground um, and lots of water. And then I can do a lot in the last, you know, that whatever working time I have left in my life, 20 years or so. Well, good luck on finding that right piece of property. Thanks. You said that you uh, became very interested in self-reliance around the age of 16. And I'm interested to know at what point did your interest in grafting kick in? Because that's really our focus today is, is the grafting. What took you down that path to grafting? Well, as soon as I got interested in just, you know, growing food in general, and especially in fruit trees, which has been a longstanding interest since my early 20s, you know, I was interested in grafting. I, I remember the first time I even found out about grafting, that it was a thing. My parents had gone to a uh, county fair and they came back and they said, oh, there's this guy, you would have really liked this demonstration. This guy was grafting. I'm like, what's that? And they're like, oh, you can, you know, cut one stick and put it on a tree and it'll heal and grow. And I was like, mind blown. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that had something to do with it. I was just, you know, maybe in sixth grade or something. Eventually, I just learned to graft from some local uh, fruit enthusiasts and like right away, because I already knew how to use a knife well from all my, you know, woodsman skills and just living in the woods all the time, uh, I went and helped a friend graft an orchard of like hundreds of trees for a new nursery. And uh, yeah, it was off from then. We should maybe step back. I know a lot of our listeners will be familiar with grafting, but let's just go right back to the beginning and, and explain what are we doing when we graft? You're taking one genetically compatible piece of wood and you're putting it on another compatible piece of wood that has some roots and uh, they'll heal together and you can grow the new thing on the old thing, the old roots. So it's pretty much that simple. Uh, not everything is genetically compatible. I get a lot of questions like, can I graft an apple onto an orange and things like that? There's some cross compatibility between species. In fact, there's quite a bit, but they have to be related. So you can graft, for instance, a pear on a quince or sometimes a pear on an apple or an apple on a pear. Uh, but typically they're a little tighter than that. You know, like almonds and peaches are genetically extremely similar. So they're pretty much cross compatible. Nectarines are the same as a peach. Uh, but yeah, the, that kind of information you have to find out. But for instance, most citrus would graft to most other citrus, at least. And and let's look at the why. Why are we grafting? There's lots of good reasons to graft. Um, you know, diversity, flexibility, collecting rare fruits that you can't get any other way. Like you're not going to get, you know, a lot of heirloom apples and rare fruits with roots on them already you just aren't so if you want to collect them you have to trade sticks with somebody and, and uh, graft them so yeah and also saving old varieties or making new varieties so i have a large apple breeding project where i'm breeding new varieties of apples so i grow an apple from seed get a new variety and I say wow this is great well that has to be carried forward somehow. And if I plant the seeds of that apple, it's going to make different apples, which is great if I want to make new apples. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if I want that apple, then it has to be propagated, uh, cloned, basically, you know, pro vegetatively propagated by growing roots on it or grafting it onto another root. And so same with old varieties. Let's say, you know, you visit someone and they're like, oh, yeah, there's this great apple tree. It's like 200 years old over by the shed there. 
and it's really great and you want to save that because it's going to eventually die well you have to propagate it somehow uh one other thing is just creativity like there's so much stuff that nobody has done yet with grafting that's just an open frontier like what one of the reasons i want a big pro flat property with lots of water and fertile soil is to do large scale grafting experiments but there are people growing you know tables and chairs that are all grafted together uh you know kind of like shade structures and things like that but there's just a huge amount of possibility there if you just think about the different shapes you could make with growing wood and then it all grows together in one piece and then you can cut it and you know you have something interesting so like i made a heart-shaped tree for instance so lots of reasons and just to expand on that like i've been really pushing the idea of uh, franken trees which are just trees with all kinds of different varieties on them you know, I have one here that had up to 150 varieties of apples at one time. It has about 100 now, and I've literally seen 100 different fruits on it in one year. Uh, so th that should be more common and, and kind of more normal because there's only so many people that need a whole tree of anything when it comes to apples, right? If you're making cider, maybe, or you do a lot of processing, or it keeps really, really well, you know, maybe, but I can have fruit off the tree here from July uh, up to February 1st. Like I have apples that are just ripe right now. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing, right? So you could have a tree that is, you know, timed that way. So you have a really good early summer apple, then a, you know, early apple, then a mid season, then a late or something like that. And if you just have four main limbs and a top on a tree, there's five varieties right there. But you can just keep adding stuff up to a point and, um, you know, the sky's the limit. Or you could have a tree that's just early apples and another tree that's just mid apples and another tree that's late apples, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing is the flexibility with that. So, you know, what I sometimes tell people is the the tree, the apple tree you should plant is any apple tree. Just plant one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because if you learn to graft, you can just change it right you if you don't like the apple or it doesn't do well in your area or you get something different or you develop different tastes or again you just want more diversity just you know it's just a couple minutes to put a graft on there and you're good to go so really it just seems like grafting in general should be really really common among people who you know are homesteaders avid gardeners and small-scale orchardists and stuff like that uh, because it just offers there's just so many reasons to do it I think that advice is great, that it's it's one of these skills that should be common. And yet I do find a lot of people are intimidated by it. So I wonder if we could step back and and talk a little bit about the the how to, where, you know, when and where do we get that wood, uh, the the root stock, when does it happen? Walk us through that process. Yeah, so you need some kind of a root to graft onto. Um, well, first of all, it shouldn't be too intimidating. The The main thing, the main barrier for a lot of people is just not knowing how to use a knife well or how to how to sharpen it. Uh, one way around the sharpening is just to get kind of a, you know, a razor knife with disposable blades. Uh, sometimes the blades are really wobbly, but you can affix them. You know, someone just wrote me and said they solved that problem by wrapping some tape around the blade and then putting it back in, hmm. for instance. So that's kind of a barrier for people, but it's really easy to just practice too. And, you know, learning to sharpen is just something you need to do if you're going to do a lot of grafting. Let's attack this from the steps and in the middle, I'll throw in, uh, you know, tools and and uh, things that you need and accessories. You do, you do need some roots and you can buy root stocks. Most root stocks that are used these days are clones. So just like any variety of apple, they're a variety of apple that's chosen for certain traits that are useful for rootstock. So that can be disease resistance and often uh, size. So size is a big one, right? If you want an eight foot tall tree, you get one rootstock. If you want a, a 30 foot tall tree, you get a different one and everything in between. So you can buy rootstocks in small quantities from uh, some nurseries. If you just search for rootstock for sale, you know, you can find them. 
in quantity i buy them you know by by bundles of 50. Uh, you can also grow your own uh, any apple seed that you plant it can be a rootstock but it will make a in most cases almost all cases will make a full-size very very large tree and a great way to go is just to graft apples you already have so if you already have apples even a crab apple tree you can graft stuff onto that and especially obviously if you don't like the apples but again maybe you just want a little bit more diversity or something like that and you can also just graft onto pieces of root so you can dig up a piece of apple root say you dig up a piece of root that's like uh, between a quarter inch and a half inch with maybe a few small roots on it and you can just graft into that wrap it up really good plant it and then you know after it grows for a year dig it up and cut off the the wrapping if it needs to be cut off and those will often self root too so the the stick that you graft on we, which we call a scion i'll be using that term a lot the scion will grow roots uh, itself as well thinking about that so where you're taking a root of of a tree you already have it makes me wonder about reproducing root stock that you like do you ever do that and if so how yeah you can grow your own root stock uh very easily actually so what you do it, it well it depends if it's a clonal root stock it's already been bred to grow roots right so that's one of the traits that they select for when you're selecting for a root stock is that you want it to grow roots easily off of the shoots because that's how they're reproduced so it's called stooling and it's very simple you can plant say a row of clonal root stocks like uh, say m111 or something or m or bud or m9 and once they grow for a year or two you just cut them off near the ground and as they grow back the next year, you pile up something like potting mix or sawdust or sometimes just soil um, against them. You can put a, like a pot over them with no bottom, like a large pot, and just fill that with damp sawdust. If you keep it damp, uh, they'll grow roots. And at the end of the year, you just take them out of there with the roots on them and, and plant them and grow them. So besides growing seedlings, yeah, it's very easy to grow root stock. And once you get those going, you know, each... Each stool, like a young stool, will make uh, maybe like six uh, to eight roots, new root stocks each year. So now we've got our root stocks, and let's talk about the the top, the scion, and when are you harvesting your scion wood? I harvest this month, January, uh, when things are in deep dormancy. In a lot of areas, that extends to February. But here by February, we're starting to see uh, little hints of spring, and you never know. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll, I'll harvest anywhere between like mid-January to mid-February. So other places, you if it's really cold like where you live, you can push that up a little bit. Um, because you don't want to store them for too long. But they, they will store for months. But, you know, you... If you don't need to harvest them, leave them a little bit longer. Uh, for storage of the collect, usually the previous year's growth. And there's a lot of guidelines in grafting that work well, but you can often break them. So oftentimes you won't find anything, uh, like say on a really overgrown tree that's in a hedgerow somewhere and it's in the shade, but you know you want to save it, but it just doesn't have any good grafting material. You can take uh, two or even three-year-old wood sometimes and craft it. That's fine. But when you have a choice, you're typically taking the previous year's growth and kind of selecting something out of the middle of it that's, you know, roughly pencil size if you can get it. Uh, but often you can't. Like, so I sell scions in the wintertime and auction them and stuff. And I'll often save just the absolute worst stuff for me to graft because I'm pretty experienced and it usually grows, right? So I'll have these little tiny twigs or like eighth of an inch or something. Uh, but, you know, it works out. But given a choice, yeah, you want to pick something around the size of a pencil or so. And for storage, uh, people tend to use too much water in storage and it can cause the scions to rot so you're going to store it in some kind of plastic or something right so that it doesn't dry out but if it's really wet in there and it's sitting against this plastic it will start to mold and rot so even when shipping i really don't store with any water what i'll do if i want to store longer term i'll use some damp sawdust and i mean damp like you could never squeeze water out of it um so it, it should be 
dry enough that if any droplets form in the bag, the wood chips will soak them up. Hmm. But it's, you know, moist enough that it's still putting, you know, keeping the humidity in the bag at 100%. And so that way you don't get any water. You don't get like the, the cyan sitting wet against a sheet of plastic, which is really bad. And you get air circulation in there. So typically what I'll do is I actually just put them in a bag dry, a Ziploc, and I seal it up tight and try not to have a bunch of air in there, like push the air out, seal it up tight, you know, roll it up and stick it in the fridge. And that alone will keep them for, you know, a few months usually. Uh, so maybe beyond two months, you might want to think about throwing in a small handful of uh, damp sawdust or something similar to that. Okay. And uh, same with shipping, like people get... I think too worried about the moisture issue and use too much moisture. And then especially if they're going through the mail and they get warm or they, you know, get lost and are delayed for a while, they can end up rotting. So uh, there's some stuff to avoid, but yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, take dormant cuttings, keep them damp until you're ready to graft them. And then as far as when to graft, you know, that's going to vary a lot. I won't hesitate to graft here as early as uh, February. But, you know, it just doesn't get that cold here. So even on a super cold night, it's not going to freeze out uh, an apple scion or something like that. Uh, so a good thing to shoot for is around bud break is a fine time to graft. So if you're starting to see bud break, that's a, a good time to graft. They usually heal fast. It's going to be a little bit warmer. Usually, you know, it won't be so hot that they're going to dry out easily. If you live in a super hot, dry area, like the desert or something, you might want to graft more in the winter, like again, February, let them get healed up and they'll be ready to grow uh, whenever they're ready. But, you know, I can only help so much with that because everyone's climate is so different, you know, but if mm -hmm. you could find someone that grafts in your area, ask them, if not, I would shoot for just before or around bud break up into where they're just leafing out. And Stephen, uh, I'm thinking maybe it would be good if we just talk a little bit about what bud break is for people who aren't familiar with that lingo. Yeah, it's just when the buds start to swell and break. So if you see the buds actually extending and showing a little bit of green or like the flower buds are starting to look like they're going to open, you know, about about that time. Hmm. And this is for this is all for dormant grafting. So there's a lot of different types of grafting, and I'm not even going to go in too much to... Uh, grafting that you do during the growing season more like budding where you take just one bud uh, sometimes without any wood on it just the bark with the bud on it and uh, slip it under the bark of another stalk there's all kinds of different ways to graft and again there's a lot of guidelines and methods that work but you can push those a lot i've grafted uh stored scions in july in a heat wave and had like 50 percent of them survive I've had stuff break uh, in the fall, say, when it's like cooling off, uh, I have a branch break and I'm like, well, if I'm going to save this, I either have to save the scion through the whole winter or I could just graft it now and see if it heals. So, you know, don't be afraid to break rules. The, the, the thing with that is just, uh, you know, doing an analysis of the cost, ben cost and risk, you know, the risk and benefit ratio there. Right. Is uh is it going to be a giant disaster if it doesn't work, or is it just a fun experiment? See if it works. So I'm mostly talking about what we call dormant grafting, which means that the wood you're grafting with is dormant. It doesn't mean that the stock is necessarily dormant. Again, a pretty good time to graft is during flowering or right leading up to it, or just uh, as the trees even leafing out. Coming up in a moment, Stephen talks about different types of grafts and explains how to use things that you might already have around the house for grafting instead of buying lots of stuff. That's coming up in just a moment. couple of shout outs today. Shout out to Louie. Louie, thank you for telling us about Stephen Edholm. And also Emma sends a shout out for Tom, who's going winter camping. We have a couple of new posts on the website. If you've ever thought about growing a lemon tree in a pot, a very comprehensive article about how you can do it. It's very possible and you can enjoy lemons, the fragrance of lemon flowers, 
and cooking with lemon leaves. So grow lemons in a pot. And the other new post that we have on the website is about how to grow a quince tree. We've had a couple guests over the past years tell us about quince. And if you'd like an article to guide you along the way, check that out. It's on the blog at foodgardenlife.com. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that brings together gardening, food, and the human story with your hosts, Emma Biggs and me, Stephen Biggs. Now, back to our chat with Stephen Edholm. And by the way, you can find Stephen online at skillcult.com and look for Skill Cult on YouTube. He has a fantastic channel. And what about good types of grafts for beginners to start with? Because there are so many different types. What, what are one or two very simple ones for people who are new to grafting? I think the probably the most accessible are the cleft graft and uh, different rind or also called bark grafts where you slip a scion under the bark of uh, uh, the stalk. So the stalk and scion, the scion's the part that you're growing is the new variety and the stalk just refers to anything you're grafting onto. So a cleft graft is uh, a real simple one and pretty easy to learn. It has two sloping cuts on the scion that make a, a long wedge. So you cut the end of the, the butt end of the scion to a, a long wedge, and then you just split the stalk with a knife right down the middle and stick the you know scion in there. And if the scion is too big uh, or too small, then you just line it up to one side. So it's real important. Uh, I'll talk about in a minute the importance of uh, lining the the scion and the stock upright. So cleft grafts are pretty easy. If you look on the internet, you can easily find uh, stuff about cleft grafts. And I have a video in my 11 part grafting series that uh, talks about a few good grafts for, you know, beginners, a cleft and whip, whip and tongue and covers rind grafts and stuff like that. We'll link to your, your grafting series in the show notes too, Stephen. Yeah. So if you look up um, also just on YouTube, Skill Cult Grafting, or go to my channel, uh, Skill Cult, on YouTube and go to the playlist and you'll find that that playlist in there. But it, it covers all this stuff from start to finish. So rind grafting or bark grafting, you lift a flap of bark and you slide the scion in there with uh, the cut faces, you know, touching together. And those are pretty easy to make. They're they're often very successful. They're a good way to use like a small piece of uh, scion on a large stock. If you happen to have a larger piece of stock, um, if the difference is like, you know, the stock is say four times bigger, that's often getting to be a good way to go with uh, rind grafting. There's some common problems, you know, that that come up and one of them is cambial contact. So the main thing we're trying to do here is line up the cambium of the stalk and the scion. What the cambium is, is it's actually the magic part of the plant that grows new cells and lays down both wood and bark. So a good way to think about it, a practical way to think about it, is that it's the little thin layer between the wood and the bark. And it's laying down wood on one side and it's laying down bark on the other side, and that's how the tree grows. So the wood itself will never grow or heal, right? So if you were to take a, a, a piece of scion and a piece of stock and touch the, the pieces of wood together and somehow affix them and keep them from drying out, they're never going to grow together because the wood is never going to grow anymore. It's just there. So you have to align the cambium of those two. And, you know, there's various tricks to do that, but basically you just want to think of it as trying to align that thin layer between the bark and the wood of one to the other. So the way that works in a bark graft, though, is different because if I cut a little flap of bark, say I cut off a stalk, like a two inch thick stalk, just straight across, mm -hmm. cut it off and then peel down a little bark uh, flap of bark on the side that piece of bark has cambium stuck to both the the bark itself and it leaves some on the wood 
so basically you have if you if you slip a cut piece in there of a scion let's say if it's cut to a wedge and the cut face of the scion is facing the wood then it has contact all around the edge where wherever it touches and it also will have contact on the back so if you take like a thin strip like just a little thin strip of bark off the back of the scion that could also heal to the flap of bark that's on there you wrap the whole thing up super tight and seal it so it doesn't die back or rot and it'll just fill up with uh callus tissue and new tissue in there and, and grow you're talking about wrapping it tightly let's explore that what what's going on there what can we wrap with and what does that look like let's talk about uh accessorizing and using household stuff because mm. a lot of people will will get into a new uh, hobby and the first they want thing they want to do is accessorize right so they go and they're going to buy like a grafting knife and a grafting book and some grafting tape and some different grafting wax and all this stuff and some of that stuff's great, but a lot of it you just don't need. So if you want to start grafting, you don't need to accessorize much. Like I can almost always walk into anybody's house and find enough stuff to graft with. I might have to sharpen a knife because <laughs> mm. the knives are usually dull. But yeah, you can get away with a lot. So for the knife, you could use like a Swiss Army knife or any pocket knife that's really sharp. So or again, a razor knife of some kind is good for the grafting tape and wrapping a really good thing that almost all gardeners have is uh, some kind of fertilizer or soil bag, like a, a potting mix bag. And those work great. So just cut like a three quarter inch strip of that stuff and you can wrap that right on there and it'll work great. Uh, rubber bands. So a big wide rubber band, you can just cut it in half or cut it open and then <clears throat> wrap it super tight and just tuck the end under there. And so, you know, for me, I do so much grafting that I buy like budding tape but a huge roll of it is less than a dollar um and then i also buy grafting paint which i like a lot uh because i use you know at least a quart of it a year but you can use thick latex paint uh white glue uh for sealing the the grafts as well so yeah uh there's a lot of household stuff you can use but for wrapping uh i think those bags are hard to beat or if you just have any you could just try different black plastic bags you know out of your uh, plastic bag stash everyone has one right uh, choose a little bit thicker bags and uh, cut them about three quarters of an inch wide and you do want to wrap tight though this is really important so this is one thing that that uh, goes wrong a lot is that the graft has to stay super stable it's like a splint right so if you break your your arm or something and it's healing up and then you you know move it just a little bit it might re-break and you have to start all over but in the case of a scion that probably means that the scion's going to die so you want to wrap it really really tight and the way to do that is just wrap it more than once. So get a good wrap on it the first time and then just wrap it again and stretch whatever you're using. Just stretch it a little bit as it goes on there and then just do a wiggle test before you walk away. If you can wiggle it really pretty vigorously and you don't see any movement within the graft union, then then you're good to go. And, and thinking about those uh, soil potting soil bags you're mentioning, they're almost they're thick enough and, and they're almost a little bit stretchy when you pull on them. So uh, I can picture the sort of material that you're you're describing as suitable for this. Yeah, exactly. The only thing about that stuff is it, it is pretty thick. So you have to cut it off at some point or it'll constrict the, the tree. Mm. But we'll talk about that at the end here. Okay. And uh, so for, for common problems that we might come across then, it's when we don't get that cambium lined up. It's when we don't wrap tightly enough. Are, are there other things that can go wrong too? Yeah. Uh, so the main thing is that you want to keep the resources, the water and nutrition in the scion long enough for it to heal, right? And start to receive that stuff from the stock. So once I cut a stick off a tree, it's going to slowly, you know, almost no matter what, start drying out a little bit. It's going to use up its energy stores a little bit. And it has to survive all that long enough to start receiving stuff from the stock. So one way around that, well, obviously good storage is important. And another thing that never hurts is to just cut the bases off, like to before you graft, just cut the base a little bit to expose new wood 
and mm -hmm. soak it in a, a jar of water overnight so it can plump up. Okay. But other than that, um, you know, weather can affect it. So if it's super hot and dry and windy, you might want to put some uh, just wrap tin foil loosely around the graft after it's grafted or put a paper bag over it or shade it in some other way. I like to seal most of my grafts completely. I, I'll seal the whole scion just for insurance because while you often don't need to, again, it's just insurance that, you know, it's going to slow that drying out if the, the um, healing happens to go slow for reasons of, you know, weather or who knows what. I'm just trying to picture that entire scion then, then wrapped so you could have a, a piece that's, I don't know, a few inches long that's wrapped for its entirety. Is that it? Um, for, for wrapping the graft itself, you just need to wrap the union to keep mm -hmm. it stable. And there are people who use uh, some stuff called parafilm, which is a very stretchy plastic, very thin plastic coated in wax. And it's thin enough that buds can grow right through it. And so people, and it also... Um, self-destruct sometimes a little too early sometimes it'll fall apart too early but you can use it to wrap the graft and then a lot of people will just wrap right all the way up the scion to the tip and and uh, leave it that way so they completely seal it and that really controls the water parafilm is a little hard to work with sometimes it's very thin uh, you have to stretch it carefully in a nice tight wrap without breaking it um, and it's fairly a little bit expensive um, so what I'll usually do is just seal the at least the end of the scion with something, which for me is usually uh, Doc Farwell's grafting seal or Doc Farwell's heel and seal, which are pretty much the same. They're just a super thick latex paint, basically. You can also use like a high gloss latex paint. The thicker it is, the better. You can put it on a couple of times. Um, and I've even used white glue before just uh, diluted just a little bit. Um, and none of those things, except maybe the parafilm, are really completely preventing desiccation, but they definitely slow it down, so it can help a lot. So that can keep them from drying out. And again, just uh, making sure you take care of your scions and keep them in the refrigerator in a bag, you know, well sealed so they're not drying out before you actually use them. Another uh, common problem is uh, people make short grafts it's easier to make a short graft. So a lot of grafts involve like a long sloping cut or a sloping cut. And it's better if that sloping cut is long because the graft is just much more mechanically strong. Well, there's a bunch of reasons actually. One is that it's stronger. So if you take, uh, say two poles, you say you have two broomsticks and you want to lash them together to make a longer broomstick. If you overlap those, say like four or five inches, it's just not going to be very strong and it'll be really easy to bend the the middle of that that lashed uh, those two lashed together poles but if you overlap them a foot and then lash the ends at you know a foot apart it'll be much much stronger so the same principle applies to graphs so if you make a graph that's only you know half an inch long you have much less mechanical strength you have much less cambial contact, right? Because it's just a smaller surface area. You know, over time, that graft is going to be weaker, you know, even when it heals. So a long grafts are really just uh, a better way to go. That sounds really good. I was just going to say, Stephen, that I have potted up in dormant about a half dozen rootstock that I stool mounted. And as you're going through this, I'm I'm starting to feel quite excited about grafting those and, and it won't be too long now great yeah um i always i have a whole row of of uh, rootstock stools and i always uh, forget to water them and and deal with them during the summer so i never get any rootstock off them so they just mm. grow shoots <laughs> <laughs> which i sometimes use for inner stem grafting which we could talk about in a minute so one other uh common problem is isolation of the graft so often the stock will want to grow itself rather than the scion that you put onto it so this can happen say if you have your uh, stool rootstock you know that you made and you're going to bench graft that so bench grafting just means that you have a, a rootstock that you can hold in your hand and move around and you sit at the bench and you graft it right and then you plant it 
So once that's planted in the ground, it will often want to grow buds, even if you pick the buds off, which is a good idea on the rootstock, so they won't grow back. They'll still keep trying to grow new buds and grow itself rather than growing your scion. So you really want to isolate that. Sometimes I'll leave one shoot growing on the rootstock until I'm sure the top and it looks like it's going to grow. But if you don't do take the suckers off, then they'll grow and the you know your graft won't grow very much. This also happens when you're uh, frameworking trees. So frameworking is putting scions onto an established tree. And instead of there's top working and frameworking. So in top working, this is like chainsaw grafting, right? You get out a big saw and you make big cuts and you graft in a few scions in like a big old stub. And then you grow the top of the tree over. That's why it's called top working. In frameworking, you have a tree. And instead of doing that, um, you just replace the fruiting wood on the framework of the tree and you keep it. So it took a long time to grow the framework of a tree, right? It could take, it could be decades old, who knows, mm -hmm. but you don't need to regrow all that. You can just replace the fruiting wood. So then you'll go and, you know, cut into stubs that might be anywhere, depending on the size of the tree, they could be anywhere from like an inch and a half, even two inches down to, you know, a half inch or less. And, you could think of a tree, a fruit tree, as having two kinds of wood, structural wood and fruiting wood. So the structural wood is like the main trunk, the main big branches, and then the fruiting wood grows off of that. And you can change the fruiting wood, you can renew the fruiting wood, but there's usually not a very good reason, except that it's fast, to cut the thing way back and replace all that entire framework again. Okay. So let's say that I have a, a tree that I'm frameworking and I have, I just want to add a variety to a tree that I already have a bunch of varieties on. So I'm going to find a suitable place, say a branch that's coming off the side of a main branch and it's three quarters of an inch or something. And I graft into that. If that isn't isolated enough, the often the growth around it will grow more than it will. So it's the same thing. It's like isolating that and giving the tree a reason to grow your scion is a good way to think about it. Mm -hmm. If you want to personify a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not out competed by those surrounding branches then. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So sometimes, you know, one way to handle that is just to cut the whole tree back all at once. So I do this with apples uh, quite a bit. If I want to, you know, change the whole tree over into a Franken tree or just another variety I'll just do the whole tree at once. So if you keep up with taking off all the little buds that are going to sprout back from the main trunk and main limbs of the old variety, it will push all the growth into whatever you graft. Stephen, somewhere I've heard you say that uh, apples are like a gateway fruit for, for new fruit growers. I wonder if we could just take a second to explore that thought. Yeah, I was going to do a talk um, for the California Road Fruit Growers, and I decided I was going to call it Apples the Gateway Fruit, <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's true. They're just, um, you know, I think you said your daughter was into tomatoes, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's the same with tomatoes. It's like there's so many different ones, and it just, it's really addictive. It's like collecting something. It becomes kind of addictive to collect these things and nerd out on them. And apples are just great for that because there's so many varieties. The season is so long. There's more flavors than you're going to get in any other, you know, fruit that we can grow out here in, uh, say, like the U.S. or, you know, cooler regions of the world. And, yeah, it's just uh, really intriguing. And while, you know, my apple breeding project and all the apple stuff I do and put on online, and encouraging other people to do this stuff kind of the subtext for me is about re reclaiming our uh, responsibility for breeding and selection of plants so breeding and selection are the uh they're just as much of part of our cultural heritage our agricultural heritage as all these heirlooms that we you know, inherit. In fact, if nobody had selected or bred those in the first place, we wouldn't even have them. And most plants 
you know, there's plenty of room for us to improve them. Like they're in no way even remotely close to being tapped out in terms of like the potential there is certainly not in apples or tomatoes or almost anything that you would get into breeding. And what has happened in general is that we've kind of gotten away from from the responsibility of that, but also saving seed and all just being generally more involved. And we've kind of left it up to experts, but those experts are working for the dominant paradigm, which is like grocery stores. So my friend uh, talked to a peach breeder and he was expressing kind of remorse that he'd spent his whole career breeding crappy peaches because he, he just bred for the market. And he's like, yeah, we didn't breed good peaches. We bred peaches that will look good when they get to the consumer. And we've all had store peaches, so mm. we know what they're actually like. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, in general, just to get people involved in horticulture and interested in stuff, and especially, like I said, in breeding and selection, um, there's certain plants, and I think tomatoes are another one, that that just are easy for people to get heavily involved in, and then you never know. So, you know, I meet people that watch my content, they, they came for the axes and then they stayed for the apples or, and they're, they're like growing apples in their backyard and grafting and they never maybe grown anything before and never thought they'd be interested in that. But, you know, it's just a little bit infectious. So yeah, that's my evil plot. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Mwahaha. Well, thank you so much for digging into grafting with us today. And uh, certainly the, the one thing that really jumps out at me is this idea of guidelines and that you can often break them and that comes right down to notions of what tools we need. So uh, thank you, Stephen. And, and maybe before we wrap up, do you have a, a last parting word of wisdom for people as they start to think about grafting? Uh, don't let it intimidate you and practice 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 so before you get out that rootstock and those scions that you ordered or got from somebody just get some tree prunings and sit down and just make graphs and make them over and over again and what you want to look for say if you're doing cleft graphs or whip and tongue graphs or something is that the the space between the two pieces of wood closes up when you squeeze it so you want to kind of uh just squeeze it shut and look at it. And if you can wrap it and squeeze it shut, it's good to go. And a lot of the problem, again, is that people just aren't good with uh, knife work. And so that could take some practice. And it's important usually to make flat cuts. So if you're not making flat cuts, um, you need to practice, you know, more. So just sit down with a pile of sticks. They could even be like willow sticks from the creek or something and just practice making the cuts over and over again. Great idea. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for having me. That was our chat with Stephen at home. And you can find Stephen online at skillcult.com. And look for Skill Cult on YouTube. It's a fantastic channel. What did you think? I was fascinated to hear Stephen talk about the idea of reclaiming our responsibility for breeding and selecting plants. He points out that it's just as important as keeping heirloom varieties going but we usually leave breeding and selecting to the experts. Most of those experts aren't selecting for the same things that you and I might select for. They're focused more on commodity agriculture, not home production. I was also glad to hear Stephen talk about using household supplies for grafting. You might already have what you need without spending a bundle on accessories. If this episode piqued your interest in growing apples, Tune in to Season 5, Episode 27, where Bob Osborne tells us about hardy apples. As we wrap up today's episode, I'm thinking about my grandfather's garden. I remember him showing guests the apple trees he'd grafted, with different branches having different varieties. I wish I'd been older at the time, so I could have learned from him. I did eventually learn the principles, although I'm not too swift with a grafting knife. I think the last time that I did some apple grafting, three grafts, I had one take. But after chatting with Stephen, I'm excited to do more, and soon. By the way, if you're interested in grafting, but you're not set up to try grafting with fruit trees this year, when I was at school, they got us to graft coleus plants. You know, the annual plants with the nice colored leaves. 
They're pretty easy to work with and you can pick two different coleus plants with different leaf patterns so that when you succeed and they're both growing, it's very gratifying. The podcast is back next Thursday and next Thursday we head to Quebec to hear about what's going on with specialty fruit crops. Laurie Brown is an agronomist with Culture Rinov and it's a very neat cooperative I think you'll be excited to hear about this. And she fills us in on what she's seeing with some of these specialty fruit crops, what has potential or not. Do you have feedback or show ideas? Or just want to connect? Find us at foodgardenlife.com or on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, where our handle is Food Garden Life. And you can find me on my website, emmabiggs.ca, and on Instagram as emmabiggs underscore grows. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. I'm Stephen Biggs. And I'm Emma Biggs. Thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm.